Well, let me just begin and be happy to answer any questions that uh, anyone has. Uh, what I just signed um, uh, and what I just said um, is that we need a political revolution, that our government belongs to all of us and not just the 1%. And that's essentially what this campaign is about. And that's why I think we are going to win. I think in New Hampshire, in my state of Vermont, all over this country, millions of people are deeply distressed that the middle class continues to disappear, that we've got 47 million people living in poverty, and that while millions of Americans are working longer hours for lower wages, almost all of the new income is going to the top 1%. That is a rigged economy, and if I'm elected president, we're going to create an economy that works for all of us and not just the top 1%. And when I go around the country, and we have had, and I want to thank the people of New Hampshire for being so generous and so kind, and for coming out to our town meetings. We've had over 17,000 people in New Hampshire coming out to our town meetings and our rallies, and I'm very appreciative of that. That's the kind of old-fashioned democracy that I believe in. But what I'm hearing in New Hampshire, and I'm hearing all over America, is that people are deeply disturbed about a campaign finance system today which is basically corrupt, which as a result of Citizens United and the establishment of super PACs enables millionaires and billionaires to pour unlimited sums of money into the political process. You know, in New Hampshire and in Vermont, we have a tradition going back hundreds of years about town meetings, people coming out and arguing about school budgets and municipal budgets. One person, one vote. And that is my idea of what democracy is supposed to be about. And last but not least, among the many issues that we have to deal with, there is growing concern about the planetary crisis of climate change and the need to transform our energy system away from fossil fuels to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. And that's something I believe in very strongly. We have a moral responsibility to leave this planet healthy and habitable for our kids and grandchildren. I've got uh, seven grandchildren, including three who live here in New Hampshire. And I'm going to do everything that I can to make that happen. Okay. Any uh, questions? Senator, Senator? you uh, have been known to draw a lot of big crowds, but there is some question about electability. Why do you think you can beat Hillary Clinton? Well, let me start off. That's a fair question and talk about electability. Uh, if you look at a number of the polls that come out, and admittedly polls this early on, you know, will have their ups and the downs. When you look at Bernie Sanders against somebody like Donald Trump or against other Republican candidates, more often than not, not always, but more often than not, I do better than Secretary Clinton does. Just, you know, a poll came out in uh, Michigan today. Uh, it was a national poll, I think it was an NBC poll, that I do better running against people like Donald Trump than the Secretary does. And I think there are reasons for that. Now, in terms of running against Secretary Clinton, look, when we started this campaign all of six months ago, we had no staff, we had no money, I would say that 80% of the American people did not know who I was, and the first polls that I saw had us at 3, 4, 5%. We have come a long, long way in the last six months. And I am enormously proud when you talk about energy and enthusiasm. At this point in the campaign, we have received more individual contributions, campaign contributions, than any campaign in American history. 750,000 people, individuals, have made contributions, averaging 30 bucks a piece. So I don't have a super PAC. And I understand that super PACs can raise huge amounts of money for millionaires and billionaires. But I'll take my chances on individual contributions coming from working families and the middle class. So to answer your question, look, we started off as the underdog. No ifs, buts, and maybes about it. We are still the underdog. But I'm proud of the progress that we have made. And I believe that we can win in Iowa. I believe we can win here in New Hampshire. And I believe we can win uh, the Democratic nomination. You believe you're better uh, than the Republicans. And I believe that once we win, and here's, let me say a word on that. Look, here is the simple reality. Republicans win when voter turnout is low. And you saw that last November, just a year ago this week, you saw that. 
63% of the American people didn't vote. 80% of young people didn't vote. Republicans won a landslide victory. In 2008, when Obama did, when Obama won and created a large turnout, Democrats won. I believe that we have the energy and the enthusiasm, that we have the support of millions of working people and young people who have kind of given up on the political process but now want to be part of this campaign. And I believe that not only can we win, we can win because we're going to create a very, very large voter turnout. That's the road to victory, not only to the White House, but to the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House, and governor's chairs all over America. Democrats do well when voter turnout is large. I think we can create that kind of excitement to bring people out who today are kind of alienated from the political process. Senator, you do a lot of big rallies, um, get, bring a lot of people out, but you don't do as heavy of the, the retail politics handshaking as a lot of the other candidates don't do. Don't believe everything you start? read in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> not always accurate. But are we going to start to see you do more of that here in New Hampshire? Ma'am, how are you? Uh, <laughs> I sure I just kissed the baby. I mean, you know, what, what, <laughs> look, uh, first of all, those people who know me from Vermont know that I'm a pretty good retail campaigner. The difficulty is, it is true, I plead guilty. Let me plead guilty. You all ready for this? I plead guilty in trying to focus on the major issues facing the middle class and working families in this country. And when I hold a rally, and I expect many of you have attended one of our rallies, they're not 15-minute speeches and jokes and everything else. We spend an hour, an hour and a half talking about the real issues facing the American people. That's who I am. These are serious times, and we need serious discussions about the serious issues facing America, and that's what I do. But as a retail politician, I think I do pretty well. You know, one of the problems you have if you go to a, a state, whether it's New Hampshire, Iowa, or anyplace else, if you're going to do three or four meetings in a day, you know what? It takes time to get going. So I don't necessarily spend, you know, an hour here or there. I've got to keep moving. Yeah. Senator, why have you not run purely as a Democrat in the past, and, and now you are? Well, I am the longest serving independent in the history of the United States Congress. That's how the people of Vermont sent me to Washington. I'm proud of that. I had to make a decision six months ago. Uh, do I run as a Democrat or do I run as an independent? And I made that decision. I am running as a Democrat, obviously. I am a Democrat now. Uh, the uh, chairman of the uh, Democratic Party, Ray Buckley, very kindly, uh, says that I'm a Democrat, should be on the ballot. Right behind you. There is Ray. Am I right, Ray? <laughs> you are. Okay. Democrat. Why have you not embraced that in the past, though? Well, that's a longer story. Uh, which, but for all, in, for this campaign right now, I am running as a Democrat. I intend to win this nomination, uh, and I intend, by the way, to help lead a transformation of the Democratic Party to bring in more young people and bring in more working people, to make sure that our campaign is our campaigns are funded by small individual contributions rather than just super PACs. And Senator, yeah. given that... Oh, Senator, one at a time. Senator, uh, you know, as you said, Chairman Buckley is here, your lawyer, Andrew Polinsky, is here today. At this point, are you confident that you will, uh, you know, be able to run and be on the New Hampshire ballot? Yes, I am. Okay. In, in future elections, potential future elections, would you also run as a Democrat? Yes. Senator, what is it about the... Uh, uh, what do you have to, to provide to, to prove that you are a Demo that you are a Democrat un under the law, as as pointed out uh, on well, the. Aletta, uh, I think we have fulfilled those requirements. You know, when you have the chairman, the chairperson of the Vermont Democratic Party, saying that I am a Democrat and should be on the ballot, when you have the chairman of the New Hampshire Democratic Party saying I'm a Democrat and should be on the ballot, I don't think I have to That's prove too much more. Um, yeah. You've outlined a very uh, ambitious uh, agenda. Right. Free college tuition. Um, universal health care, yeah. campaign finance yeah. reform, in an era when we can barely pass a budget. Aren't you really being dishonest with your supporters to outline such an ambitious proposal when they really, maybe one might get passed, but in this uh, No, I don't, I don't think I am. Um, this is what I believe. What I know to be true is that in the last 30 years, there has been a massive transfer of wealth in this country going from the middle class and the working families of America to the top one-tenth of one percent. Top, top one-tenth of one percent has doubled the percentage of wealth that they own in America, while the middle class continues to disappear. And I believe that if we can rally the American people to get involved in the political process, they will be supportive of every major proposition that I have brought forth. 
It is not a radical idea to say that in the year 2015, public colleges and universities should be tuition free. Because in my view, a college degree today is what a high school degree was 50 or 60 years ago. It is not a radical idea to say that the United States of America should not be the only major wealthy country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people. And that we have today a health care system which spends more per capita than any other system on earth. I don't think that's radical. It's not radical to say that we should not be paying the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. It is not radical to say that we should not be having a trade policy which results in the loss of millions of decent paying jobs as companies shut down here and move to China. It is not radical to say we should not be the only major country on earth that doesn't provide paid family and medical leave to our people. So to answer your question, what I say to you and what I have said over and over again is that the way we make change in this country is when millions of people, including many who have given up on the political process, who have not voted, get involved in the process and demand that the United States Congress start representing all Americans and not just wealthy campaign contributors. When that happens, there is nothing that we cannot accomplish, in my view. Thanks, everybody. Can I ask one question about education, if you yeah. don't mind? You're talking about college, public college being free for everybody. Wouldn't that drive so many people because then it, it's not your competitive edge. So then people are going to have to get a master's degree or an even higher degree, and they're going to end up having to pay for it. So it's not No, no, no. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't look at it that way at all. How do you the way it? I look at it is that 60 years ago in America, what public education was about, what people fought for in Vermont, in New Hampshire, all over this country, was to say, you know what, I want my kid to be able to get an education and not have to work in a factory or work in the fields. And so we fought for public education. And what free public education meant is that from first grade to 12th grade, regardless of the income of the family, that kid could go to school. Pretty radical idea 60 years ago. And what I believe that in the year 2015 is that a college degree today, in terms of making it into the middle class, is more or less what a high school degree was 50 or 60 years ago. And we should proceed accordingly. Why is it that Germany can do it? Why is it that many countries around the world can provide free public education through college? I believe our kids deserve that as well. Thank you all very, very much.